with your amber beads. Are those amber? Yes. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Did you, did you get them in Russia? I, I didn't. Yeah. I just there was a uh, Russian shop at what time was on Ogden Avenue? Okay. Forty fifty years ago. Oh, wonderful. Got okay. It from there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Great. Okay. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, welcome to the Lizadra Museum. My name is Sarah. I'm the educator here. Um, and I'm so pleased you all came out. So let's uh, join me in welcoming Steve Zick. Steve is the director of Christie's Midwest, and he has been so for 20 years. Um, and today he's discussing the state of the global art mar market. Global art market. Um, and this we're very excited to have him here because a lot of his topics and what Christie's does corresponds with our special exhibit, which hopefully some of you have seen already. And if you have not, you should definitely check it out. It's the Richard H. Driehaus Lapidary Collection. It's in the back in the special exhibit hall. So if you have not yet seen it, make sure you see that. Um, but please do help me in welcoming Steve Zick. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I have um, first a couple things to say. I am not a specialist myself. I'm a recovering lawyer, and I worked. Um, <laughs> my my first courtroom partner was Rod Blagojevich. So before, oh, yeah. So I was a Cook County State's Attorney, and went on from there to the Illinois Attorney General's Office, where I worked on famous serial killers like um, John Wayne Gacy and Richard Speck. So. My joke is I've always dealt with the dead, but now they tend to die of natural causes and they have art collections. So, um, but it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm one of several um, representatives here in the Midwestern market. We're in the Hancock building. We've been there since 1997. And we take basically every phone call from a 13 state radius around us, from Omaha in the west to Cleveland in the east, buying and selling, living or dead, um, institutional buying and selling, um, you know, hire my granddaughter as an intern, that sort of thing. We do it all. And so as a, as a recovering lawyer and as a generalist, I'm jack of all trades and master of absolutely none. So um, I'm asking for your forbearance, and you're probably going to know some of these pronunciations better than I do. So, but I, I do love Asian art. I do love gems and jewelry. Um, I'll get to a point. I'll tell you the story when I had Elizabeth Taylor's 44 carat diamond ring stuck on my pinky. So they almost uh, got the saw out. But. Um, Anyway, it's, it's, it's a great, fun job. Can you hear me OK, Sarah? You're good. Great. So here, it's a wonderful old print. This is Christie's. Believe it or not, we predate the Declaration of Independence by 10 years. We were founded in 1766. So we've been doing this a very long time. This room is still what we call the Great Rooms in King Street in the Mayfair neighborhood of London. And it's, it's just, I mean, some people say that we're the second world's oldest profession. So um, <laughs> auctions have been around since ancient Rome, if not before. But um, we've been handling celebrity sales, too, since the 18th century. Madame de Pompadour's jewels were sold by Christie's. And James Christie helped found the collection. He sold the works of the Walpole family to Catherine the Great of Russia in the 18th century to help found the Hermitage. So there have been a long tradition of important sales, celebrity sales, and institutional sales. So I'll touch on some overall trends in the art market, and I'll also look at the single owner sale and the power of philanthropy, and then we'll end with some Q&A. So always happy to, to talk about that. So trends in the art market. What's going on? I mean, I, it's, it's fascinating. Asian art market, and I thought I'd use the Lozadro's own an incredible uh, green jade eye pagoda. Asian art has been a real booming part of the market for a long time now. It's truly global. We've seen things like the American Art Department, the American Folk Art Department, Americana, Decorative Arts, Colonial Silver, that sort of thing has sort of leveled off. We did have a very successful sale last month in, in New York with the Americana sales, but it tends to be a national market. It tends to be sometimes even a regional market. You get the old Yankees of Boston who still want their Chippendale High Boys, but the Chinese art, the Asian art market in general, is, is really on an upward tangent. It has been for a very long time. And I think what's exciting about it is that the generations seem to renew. So it's not just an aging market. You should see the crowd of guys that just want the duck decoys. They're all, you know, average age 89. And they, um, they're old hunters you know, or fishermen and that sort of thing. They buy their fish decoys. 
but the Chinese art markets, we get what we call handling sessions in New York, in Rockefeller Center. We're right next door to the Today Show, and so I would encourage all of you to come by. It's like a temporary revolving museum. It, ha it happens several times a year, dozens and dozens of times a year. Right now, we have the collection of Elton John has just been installed. So Elton John and his husband are leaving Atlanta after many, many years, and they're putting all the contents of their Atlanta residence up for sale. So it's a fantastic opportunity to learn and to be exposed to great things. And I'm awfully proud of the way we can do it. But Asian art, and aren't we lucky to have the Lazadro here in Chicagoland, to have the, the, the taste, the foresight, the generosity of Mr. Lazadro. And I, I was um, talking to a wonderful new director, and I, I was at the old Elmhurst location. I've spoken there in the past, and I sort of missed it until I got here. And this is amazing. This is much bigger and more spacious, and I think, I think it's a really great move. So what else? We have, you know, I've, again, Harkening back both to my love of gems and jewelry and lapidary arts, when you see the, the amazing virtuosity of the carvers, the artists who can somehow one single chunk of jade, nephrite or jadeite, this one's jadeite, and you see the green are, the, are the, the leaves and somehow, and then they keep the lavender jade for the body. Isn't that amazing? You wonder how many times that they had to start over <laughs> when they didn't get the, but it's, the finished product is absolutely fantastic. This one to Chinese art. Um, I, love the, I love the voiceover narration of the Green Jade Eye Pagoda, by the way. Um, what else? This is just another example of the work here. Whoops. Someone's here. Go. Regency Blue John vases. I love these as well. These come up quite often. The Ann and, Gordy, Ann and Gordon Getty collection we've sold in several volumes. We just concluded the last sale of their. Um, Central Valley Farm, Ann Getty was an amazing uh, polymath of a character. She was self-taught in decorative arts, but she was a trained archaeologist. Her husband, Gordon, who survives her, was uh, more into performing arts and in music. So Ann had these amazing tastes, very refined. And our English specialist, who would come in periodically to appraise and update the collection, because we had a very long um, relationship with the family, they said that, they, that even Buckingham Palace didn't have the, uh, the furniture in such good shape as, they, as the Gettys managed to do. So in the Bay Area, they also had a wonderful arts and crafts slash um, aesthetic movement house uh, in the East Bay. And the final house we just sold was Ann's old um, walnut farm in the Central Valley of California, which, of course, she transformed into something that sounds like Big Valley with Barbara Stanwyck, but it, no, it was much grander than that. So, but Blue John is, is a wonderful material. I know there, there are some wonderful examples here at the Lozadro, so I wanted to include these. And if you ever get a chance, periodically down at the Art Institute downtown, they have one Blue John vase. And they're often pairs, as you see here. And I remember asking the curator, well, um, where's the other one? And they said, well, the Queen of England has it at Buckingham Palace, and she won't <laughs> give it over. So they, <laughs> I, apparently both institutions want to reunite the Blue John, but it's not happening. So, but there's, there's one a very good one here in Chicago. And we sold this. You'll see the quotes. I guess one thing to mention about the auction world, about collection sales, estate sales, the, the collecting public, the buyers, the collectors, they love things that have been in private hands for a number of years. So when you have a, a sort of a mythical name like Getty, one of the great you know, industrial families of America, and you get the fact that it's been in that collection for a very long time, the provenance speaks to our buyers, and so you'll often see prices that will exceed the high estimates. So seventy dollars to $100,000 auction estimates, which are basically a marketing tool, if I could mention that. It's something you want, to, you want to recognize the importance of an object, but you also want to make it enticing enough so that people think they have a chance. And that's when you get a real auction. You really need at least two people, and preferably you need 20 in the room, all raising their paddles at the same time. So, this sold very well and exceeded its high estimate. Here we have um, something we've sold. This is a fantastic artist, Kibayashi, lychee nuts. And we sold this from the Lee family of Chicago, Illinois. What's wonderful about Chinese art is sometimes it descends in multi-generational holdings. So our buyers also like the fact that they have proven provenance, things have been established and held in known collectors. There are niche collecting categories, and people knew about the Lees in Chicago. So the fact that it came out of that collection, you'll see how well it did. So um, where were we? It, 
doubled. So 102,000, we had it in Hong Kong dollars, which always sounds so much more impressive. But we had 102 to 153,000 high estimate, and it more than doubled at 351,000. And this beautiful, beautiful work, Zhang Daochen, who Lotus in Rain, he lived all over the world, and he sold a lot of things. A lot of them turn up in Chicago, believe it or not. So go home and check the closet, because you never know. Um, he, he, some people called him the Picasso of China, and they're very beautiful. He spent time in Brazil, so he absorbed a lot of the, the rich, tropical, uh, influenced coloration of South America. But again, right now, it's a global audience is buying him. So he did very, very well in our most recent auction in Hong Kong. And a subset is Korean art. We have this moon jar from the Joseon dynasty. And it's a smaller, it's a niche market. But Seoul and Korea is becoming such an important presence in the contemporary art world that people are now looking at the older material as well. So people are going to Seoul for these incredible contemporary art fairs, all the major Contemporary art dealers like Larry Gagosian are going to Seoul, Korea. It's a city, believe it or not, it's, it's maybe eight times as big as Chicago. So it's about you know, 25 million people. And so the money is huge there. And what's fascinating with Korean art and most of the Asian categories is how the new generations, they want to repatriate things. And they, just, um, they really, really covet things that have been in, in important collections, imperial provenance in China is, is all important. And interestingly, in the old days, you, you may remember TV shows like in the 60s, the Brady Bunch would have an amazing tong horse on the, in, on the landing of that split level house in the 60s. Uh, um, what is it called? Um, the one with uh, Family Affair. They had a Park Avenue apartment and there was always a tong terracotta, you know, like the terracotta warrior material. The Chinese wouldn't touch it for years because those things were associated with, with graves and funerary practices. So it took a very long time for that material to be coveted again by, the, by Asians and by the Chinese in particular. They're starting to, but give them an imperial stamp and they, they go crazy. So that's, that's what really resonates. The, South, the Southeast Asian market is also booming. So we have this large and important gracious figure of Buddha, and it did extremely well. What is tricky about Southeast Asian things and about so many categories are um, provenance issues, when was it taken, when did it arrive in the United States, how, is there any implication that it was taken improperly, illegally, is it going to turn up on a, on a list. Um, I worked on, I've only had one Nazi restitution case in my years at Christie's and it was, it was kind of fascinating. It was a house in Lake Forest. It had nothing but porcelain birds but one good Renoir over the fireplace. And of course, as we were cataloging it, we submit everything to um, the various databases that make sure that things that might have been in Europe during the war period um, aren't on it. Well, the Renoir showed up. And it turned out it was claimed by an Austrian family who they saw the writing on the wall as soon as Hitler was elected in 1933, and they sold all their art to um, finance their escape. And so in, when that happens, Christie's acts as a neutral arbiter, and we are the custodian of the work while the dispute is, is resolved. So um, a couple years later, um, the, the three children of this wonderful family in Lake Forest, they were very chagrined by it. It was, it was a front page news in the Chicago Tribune one Sunday, so I can talk about it. But you know, their parents bought it in good faith out of a Madison Avenue gallery in New York in 1955, 10 years after the, the war had ended. But uh, what they call flight asset marshaling, where you are not perhaps, you know, Gehring didn't walk into your house and take it off the wall, but you saw, you were under duress, you sold things you loved in order to permit your departure. So that has now become a much more recognized avenue of acclaim. And so, the, uh, I'll never forget the son said to me, you know, can we tack another 150,000 onto this, the value of this Renoir? And I said, no. So I figured that, you know, he, he settled and was able to keep some of it, and some of it went to the claimant family. So. But it's, it's a tricky area, you know, and so it's, um, it's a lot of work getting things to sale, especially in these sort of problematic categories. Here we have um, an example, Southeast Asian modern and contemporary date sale. I think part of the boom, and I love contemporary art too, it's very exciting. Um, you don't have the, let's say, the finite supply issues once the artist is gone, right? Things become, we'll talk about rarity in a little while. But 
contemporary art is, is in some ways easier to collect. You have less problems about forgery. You have, you know, the artist is often alive to authenticate it himself, or sometimes his children can still authenticate it, but it's, it's in some ways it's just easier, you know, and it's, um, and it's also hipper in a way. So you have the whole scene aspect of con collecting contemporary art that we've seen, and, and it's continuing on strongly. Even there, there are dips in popularity among various artists, but people do love bright colors. This, this artist, who I don't know very well, Manjit Bawa, um, recently deceased, but the colors, he clearly harkening back to traditional practices and imagery, but the contemporary colors make it very desirable. And Hussein, even a generalist like myself, there are, there are several um, important uh, Indian artist collectors here in, in the Midwest, in the Chicagoland area, and Hussein seems to be a just, also, you can see influenced by Western names like Picasso and, and the Cubists, but stands on his own. Look at that, look at that um, hammer price of a million two just in September. So South Asian, modern and contemporary. I saw some beautiful chairs out in the galleries, and this is a wonderful crossover category that we're noticing. Chinese furniture, classical furniture, some of, this is 17th century, if you can believe it. You know, the, the, the pilgrims had just washed ashore and they were trying to make friends with the Indians and, and have their first Thanksgiving, and this level of sophistication was happening in China. So you see incredible woods, incredible design, designs that are so sleek and contemporary even today that they are being used in very transitional, very eclectic interiors. So they're, um, they're not fussy, so they have, they're somehow very, very sleek, clean, and 400 years old. I mean, it's really quite incredible how Chinese furniture works. And as in many art categories, there is a hierarchy of desirability. So this is called Huang Hua Li, which is an incredible wood. We get woods that are less desirable, but it, apparently it's a neck and neck race between Huang Hua Li and Zitan. And they're both um, very desirable, very rare woods. So we'll touch more on rarity. Other categories re require that too. But it's, it's a wonderful thing to see, and they just, um, they're so beautifully made, they rarely need any kind of restoration. So look at the price there, two to three million dollars. We knew what we had, and it sold just, just below the high estimate. I don't think you'd let the grandkids sit in it, though, would you? I mean, that would be a little nerve-wracking. And again, I think Chinese art is so desirable and so transferable. Here we have J.J. Lally. I mentioned earlier that there were premiums placed on collections that come out of private people, private collectors. But J.J. Lally was in a class by himself as a scholar and as a collector in his own, in his own right. He was a very famous Manhattan dealer, and if he had it, you wanted it. So when we, he sold up his inventory just less than a year ago, you can see what this brought, this very rare Guan bottle vase. I can't remember the size, I think it's quite petite actually, but I mean, isn't that incredible? We once had a story where there was a red ceramic bowl that was in a house in San Francisco and it was being used for guac and chips and, um, and <laughs> cracked crab and everything. And we, a specialist came through on just a, a random house appraisal visit and looked at that and said, why are you serving the guac in this bowl? I mean, we think this is important. And it sold for a million eight. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, but things get handed down, you know. Great Aunt, Great Aunt Alice's, you know, red bowl is um, worth having a second look at. Here we go into um, uh, more classic things, uh, Western art, of course, Picasso, so prolific, not exactly rare in some ways, but always desirable, a household name, a blue chip artist, and when it comes from the, the Reitman family, they were important Hollywood producers. Um, and so they sold their collection with us last season in November, just a few months ago. And you see this incredible, incredible Picasso, which he sold for $42 million. Here's a Devon Corn, slightly atypical, I thought. I mean, th that patterning there on the left could almost be influenced by Bouillard, you know, one of the Impressionists or a post-Impressionist. I think that was quite beautiful. But uh, from another prominent West Coast collection, and recollections of a visit to Leningrad. So maybe that painting was something he saw at the Hermitage that I mentioned earlier. And we had a very high estimate on it, and it sold for a very high price as well. 
This is one of my favorites. This came up, um, it was from the Whitney collection, and Henri Rousseau, there were only 240 of them in the world, the paintings, and he was self-taught. He was, he was um, incredibly cherished by Picasso and by the ones that came after him, but he was the self-taught artist. He based his, his works often on prints. So if you look at those birds, that they don't look like any flamingo seen in life. I mean, I, I'm not sure when flamingos first made it to the Paris Zoo, but he never saw one in life. So you see the beak is all wrong, but the, you know, the, the tropical um, riverfront or lakefront there and the, the, the lotus plants are all out of scale. But um, this was just an, a wonderful work. And we see things like this, of course, when, when it comes time to divide up an estate, you have multiple heirs and, and descendants who can't you know, carve up a painting. This one came with a, a real sort of a, a scary moment, though. The room it was in caught fire in Manhattan. And so it was above the fireplace. Luckily, no harm came to it. But I think the, uh, the heirs decided, like, what are we doing with something like this in the living room? It's time to um, sell this and divide it and put several generations of grandchildren through college. So. Um, that sold just about a year ago, and it was a beautiful thing. It was every bit that big. That's a life-size um, depiction of it. There's a really cool one at the Art Institute. I'm, I'm forgetting the actual subject matter, but once you see Rousseau, you, you recognize him immediately. Another market moment we're seeing is African-American art and African-American artists, whether um, classic, like, um, you know, mid 20th century things, some of the self-taught guys like Edmondson. Um, but that is something that every sale has to have nowadays because the, the response to it is so robust. So we're really enjoying the, the, the birth. Some of these are not household names. Reggie Burroughs Hodges was not a household name to me, but we, we don't make markets. I suppose I should point that out. What we do is try to reflect markets. We don't take, um, some self-taught artist who is, you know, like Lee Godey, who used to sit on the steps of the Art Institute, and she called herself an impressionist until she mentioned that to a curator out on Michigan Avenue, and the curator said, you're not an impressionist, and she went off in such a huff, she never returned to the Art Institute to sell her works. She was very much an outsider artist, you know, but um, her things turn up now a little bit, but um, what we try to do is, is reflect markets that are already there. We're called the secondary market, so auctions are are here, but we also try to stay abreast of changes, stay abreast of market movement, and start to include more artists as, as the prices increase. So we're also on the lookout for Reggie, Reggie Hodges. This is just a pretty picture we put in. Stephanie Hines, new. So we are trying occasionally. Sometimes, sometimes a working artist can be just a friend of one of the specialists, and they're like, let's try something. Sometimes they, they sink without a trace and we don't try them again, you know. But this one, uh, sixty eighty thousand dollars $80,000, and she sold for two hundred thirty nine. dollars So, interesting work. Sometimes they're Larry Gagosian's girlfriend, Anna Wayant, and we try that one. And sometimes her works do very well, too. But they just broke up, so we'll, keep, we'll have to watch this space, see if Anna will maintain her market um, uh, vitality. But back to the old. Here we have things... You wonder, oh my goodness, old-fashioned taste, right? But this was bought by the Cleveland Museum of Art, and they chased it. What's wonderful about our museum clients is that they, they are they're very interested in all the categories. There are all the great, sometimes neglected categories. What they're not great at sometimes is, is um, marshalling the amount of funds needed to buy things at auction. They sometimes don't have... Um, the, the, they're not quick enough, they're not nimble enough, they've got to go to their boards, you know, I have to ask the trustee, I need 100 from you and 100 from you, and, but the Cleveland Museum, beautifully endowed, has a world-class collection. Um, if you haven't been there recently, they've, they've got that amazing new addition on the, on the north side in Museum Circle in Cleveland, but they were able to chase this to a million five. So, it's incredible, incredible, early 17th century Nautilus, so that's a, that's, you know, organic material. I thought, Grow with the love of um, stones and precious metals and all that would be a, a great thing to post here. So look at that, and it's gone to a very good home. That's the best. That's the best result ever when things go into a museum and they will be seen. You know, they the public. Sometimes it's very sad. We sold the Salvatore Mundi. Do you remember the last Leonardo? And it hasn't been seen since. You know, which is very sad. But. Um, and about that controversy, I, I did see it in person, and I, you know, I've seen a handful of Leonardo's in my lifetime, and this one had the same sort of 
gravitas and aura about it. So, you know, it was, it was really fun to see, but who knows where it is now, right? Here we have um, Rothschild taste. So, in addition, like the Gettys, you know, were, were sort of aping the, the earlier generations of European connoisseurs that came before them. And you have this amazing palissy, um, large oval dish. I don't know if anyone saw the movie Saltburn, which is sort of a disturbing <laughs> flick about um, class warfare in England, but the, the maker, Bernard Palissy, that, that a plate like that plays sort of a, a plot in the movie, which is interesting. That doesn't come up all the time. But the Rothschilds, they were such famous connoisseurs and such acquisitive people and built so many amazing houses in various countries, including Wadsden Manor in England, which is now a National Trust property. They actually um, sort of developed their own brand. It was called Le Steel Rothschild. So they, these are not minimalists. They would layer things to an incredible degree. And they had, that's, that's the interior. We sold the, many of the contents of that house on the far right, the Chateau de Ferrière. And so, yeah, so this sale also incredibly, even, even the Rothschilds can benefit from clearing out the attic occasionally. So they're like, you know, things that, that um, are no longer in, in style for them. Back to the Gettys for a minute. And again, this is a wonderful story. This Canaletto was in the house in San Francisco. And it was about to go up for auction. And people were getting ready. They, they were asking for condition reports. They were doing absentee bids. But the museum, uh, the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco got it right before the sale. So there was a private sale negotiated. And that, too, will be on public view, So, which is a very happy ending for this amazing scene of Venice. And philanthropic collection sales. That is a trend we're seeing now in the marketplace. A lot, a lot of families, you know, they have they have plenty, and they want to they want the proceeds of sales to help benefit wonderful institutions. So we're seeing a lot of that in the market. Here are the Rockefellers, another R family. Um, after the Rothschilds, David Rockefeller and his wife Peggy, they had at least ten charities that benefited from the sale of their possessions. They, you know, they lived to a well. He lived to a vast age. I was lucky enough to meet him when he was 101, and he was coming out of a building in Maine. And I was already 55. And he said, well, nice to meet you, young man. And I, well, <laughs> I hadn't heard that in a while, so that was you know, really nice. But um, great collectors. Um, there's that wonderful Picasso behind him. Do you see that? That is the um, Manhattan townhouse. And the, um, we had trouble touring that, because the Middle East didn't want a naked girl. So it's funny the cultural problems that arise as you take things around the world to show it. I mean, it's, you know, if it's, you sort of think to yourself, well, if it's good for David Rockefeller, you know, but there, you can't sell naked girls. And she apparently was a rather famous, um, not quite a courtesan, but she was not just an artist model, shall we say, in the Paris of her day. So a busy young girl. Um, so that, that stayed in the States and, and did very well. Here he is, this, this Rothko. He had an amazing breadth of taste and curiosity and, and was always willing to learn. And so here he is, this man who's surrounded by, you saw that very traditional um, red room in, and his houses in, in Maine and Kaikit up in Westchester were also, I think, very traditional. But he embraced this and I think as part of his um, role as head of the Chase Manhattan Bank in Manhattan. He saw things that showed off well in, in more sleek, contemporary settings. So he was a great fan. And he's certainly astute financially. So he sold that for this. This he sold during life. So he sold that for $72 million. Here we have the interiors of the house. There's, there's um, the young lady there on the right again. The china, that was Peggy's great love. But Oddly, she was also obsessed with the barns of New England, and a lot of the proceeds went to um, preserve open farmland, preserve stone walls. Uh, Acadia National Park in Mount Desert Island in Maine was another great love of hers. And if you were lucky enough to be invited to dinner, she would make note of which of her many porcelain services you were served on. And so it went down into the basement. And if you came back to dinner, you would never have the same service twice. So <laughs> she um, was a consummate hostess. Here we have the Paul Allen collection, the Microsoft founder. So he was a masterpiece buyer. The ma masterpieces are interesting. People will stretch even in the depths of a recession. Do you remember 2008, 2009, things were so grim. 
And we had, though, at the time, um, Yves Saint Laurent passed away. And so we had a four-day sale in the Lorangerie in Paris. And I think at that time, with a single chair that was designed by Eileen Gray, the famous um, French-Irish designer, her chair sold for $39 million. So people do stretch, even in, in um, tight financial times for masterpieces. So Paul Allen had, of course, the deepest of pockets. We have that wonderful Syrah here on the right. This is not life-size, as opposed to that um, wonderful Rousseau. This is a very tiny thing. It's like a, a piece of um, paper. And I remember calling the curators at the Art Institute to say, you know, there's, this was painted in Seurat's studio. And you could see his afternoon of the Grand Jade is hanging on the wall. So, and so um, the curator said to me, well, that's OK. We have the big one. So <laughs> she did. <laughs> and this ended up selling, the one on the left, for $130 million. So. Um, Things like this, they don't come up often, and, but when they do, people like to stretch for them. The sale was 100% sold. I think it was one of the very first single-owner billion-dollar sales. We sold um, $1,506,000. So five paintings sold for over $100 million, and um, it's a lot of it. Oh, forgive me. The, the final total was $1.6 billion, and it all went to philanthropy. So Paul Allen's causes are... Uh, if they call asking for more money, say, we understand you're well endowed. So. so this is sort of a typical exhibition. There's more Paul Allen. He had a Botticelli up there. You see that um, amazing Giacometti. There's a Magritte, that gorgeous tree there, fantastic Calder, the wonderful Oldenburg. And what often happens there on 49th Street, I promise we'll let you in first, so you won't have to wait in line. But sometimes with Elton John, apparently the lines are already um, streaming around the block. There it is. Oh, it brought more than I thought. 149 million. Les Poseuses. It's a beautiful, and it, you know, classic pointillism. Oops. Back to the Gettys. Here you get a sense of what she was up to. Not a minimalist, but everything of the absolute finest. And she was, she was so casual and confident in her taste that she would often, if it, if it worked better in her salon-style hang, she'd put the Monet way up in the corner. And you'd have to be like, is that, a, is that a haystack up there? She'd be like, mm -hmm, yeah, I just think it looks better up there. So, and it was, it was museum worthy. This is true. This, they would entertain, and nothing ever disappeared. They had great groups in there, whether they were political fundraisers. Um, Gavin Newsom's father is a judge of some sort, and he apparently had his own room in the, in the house for years and would just kind of come and go and with his cigar smoking backroom Politico friends. And, you know, no Malachite obelisk ever disappeared. It was really, people treated it with, with oh, there you see, there's the, Mo, the Monet. Do you see up at the top? Winter scene. So, um, and many of the chairs, it's interesting, a lot of things, they bought things like Spencer House, the ancestral home of Lady Diana Spencer. And, you know, they can't afford to buy them back. The, the chairs went to another private buyer. They are not going back to Spencer House, sadly. They are you know, in a new private collection. But that's, that's the way of the world now. Every, every generation of wealth sort of uh, renews itself, and not always in the same place. This was a, this was a really fun one. Elizabeth Taylor, she was um, jewelry obsessed. Can you imagine the starlets of today? You see them on the red carpet, and they have to borrow all their jewels. But she, she married well. And many, you know, many husbands, many boyfriends who gifted her things. So, that's the, the Krupp diamond on the upper left. That's the one. She was quite petite, and that barely got on my pinky and barely got off. So um, she loved her emeralds. There was another famous stone. I wonder if we have that. Now, these are her costumes. She has the tiara. Does anyone know the rule about tiaras? You see Elizabeth Taylor wearing that tiara. You don't have to be royal or a noble. You just have to be a married lady. So, any, so if, you know. Unmarried gals in the audience, don't, don't, go, don't go putting on a tiara. You'll be breaking the rules. But so this was her a typical setup. So Elton John's going to look pretty much like this. These are her various clothes. She, you know, she had a great head start in life. She had her own art collection because her father, Michael, was a famous London art dealer. So Liz Taylor was not, um, she didn't start from, from nothing, shall we say. We recreated her, her, I can't remember now if it was Bel Air or Brentwood. I think this was 2011. So, but we recreated her closets and her caftans. It was, it was all very 70s in there for a while. 
And here's the Red Cross diamond. This Christie's has sold multiple times for philanthropic causes. So you see, um, what's interesting to me about diamonds is that the colors are more desirable depending on which color you have. So um, green, green or red are the rarest kind of color in diamonds. And they're also very, very hard to get in a substantial size. Um, blue, of course, the Hope Diamond is, is, a, is probably next. Then we go to yellow. White diamonds are great, but the color diamonds are what really resonate in the market now. And so this one, this is about as they, they call this, they're all graded very carefully. This one I think is like fancy yellow. Um, and it's, it's always, every time it's sold, it's brought very well. This, this was my favorite cold call. So it was Christmas Eve and I was getting ready to leave for the holiday. And the phone rang, and it was the proverbial little old lady, and she said, I'm the curator of the Minnesota Historical Society, and it's, just, it's the James J. Hill House on Summit Avenue in St. Paul. And he was, he was like one of the early robber barons of the upper Midwest. He was kind of the Henry Clay Frick of the Twin Cities. And I said, well, oh, tell me, what's, what's going on? She said, well, the granddaughter of Mr. Um, Hill wants to gift a sapphire brooch surrounded by diamonds, and it's in its original Tiffany box, and it is, um, we have the Christmas card from 1886. Would you be interested? And I said, tell me more. You know, like, <laughs> I haven't had any of the start of the Christmas shopping, so, but I, she said, well, I don't know if you'll be interested. We have, a, we have an appraisal that says it's worth $60,000. Is that worth enough? And I said, oh my God, that's our sweet spot, of course. What she, what she didn't tell me was that the appraisal was dated 1930. So, <laughs> So um, I noticed there's a 15 carat sapphire in the jewelry case. This one is 22 carats, so it's bigger. So the, the Brinks truck came the day after Christmas, whisked <laughs> it right to New York. And what's fascinating about stones of this size and this color and importance, they subject them to a number of tests. So first they were able to tell that it had never been injected with anything to hide any flaws because it was internally flawless. Then they were able somehow to tell that it had never been heated up to improve. It was already this, this is what the Hope Diamond looks like, right? It's like, it's that deep, beautiful cornflower blue. It's the best blue you can have. And finally, they can also tell which mine it comes from. And apparently it comes from the best extinct mine in Kashmir. So um, she was too nervous to go to New York and it was, it was right before you know, online viewing had been instituted. But we set her up with a phone line and she started crying when it hit a million dollars. And finally, it's, it hammered for just over $3 million, which at the time was the most expensive auction price achieved for a sapphire in the history of the world. So, so again, if the um, Minnesota Historical Society calls asking for money, they don't need any. They're just, they're doing, <laughs> they're doing just fine, so. But, you know, so colored gemstones, again, uh, very, very hot in the market. Other, other whoops, we'll go back, just end on the jewelry. It's the name brands that people are looking for. You, we get calls for loose stones all the time, and that's not really our sweet spot. We, it's, it's Van Cleef, it's Bucciolati, it's all the things that we sold in, in Liz Taylor's estate that resonates with people. Boucheron, um, Tiffany, Cartier, all the, all the usual suspects. That's what, that's what people love. Again, they love that, that validation, that provenance, that, that history of, of fine craftsmanship, et cetera. Now we have the celebrity sales just in the past year or two. Andre Leon Talley, all his sales went to benefit um, two Baptist churches, one in his childhood home and one in, in Harlem. So that brought in a great windfall to them. And of course, Donna Summer, also philanthropic sales. So we've got a real thing. Oh, and this is me. So uh, this is my favorite New Yorker cartoon. Per the man is dead under unknown circumstances on the floor. Perkins, you call my lawyer and I'll call Christie's. So, but um, anyway, thank you for this little journey through um, the art market and what's hot, what's not, and let me take any questions if you have any. Yeah. Yes.